Oh boy, what can be said about Bible Man? A lot of things, really, and a lot of people have already said them. Take a look at the search results for Bible Man on YouTube. You'll find just tons and tons of people reviewing it and making fun of it and all that sort of stuff. However, few people actually manage to get to the root of the problems with Bible Man in general. I'm in one of the very rare situations on YouTube in that not only did I grow up in a Christian household, but I'm still a Christian today and proud of it. And even I can tell you that Bible Man is not a good show, whether it be a show in general or a Christian show, and I want to tell you why today. Because we're going to be reviewing every single episode of Bible Man, and you're going to see it all. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Oh boy, there's a lot of ugly. Mostly with this guy, but we'll get to him later. So sit back and relax as we cover Willie Ames' really strange Christian children's show, Bible Man. Before we begin, I just want to say that this is a Patreon raffle review courtesy of Reziel. And if you too would like your idea for a Media Mementos review to actually happen, then consider donating to our Patreon, where once a month, we have a raffle to determine the last review of that month. Link in the description below, by the way. First off, a general overview of Bible Man's history, its plot, and all the crazy things that happen behind the scenes. It started off with Willie Ames, this guy who was in a bunch of sitcoms, like Charles in Charge and Eight is Enough. He led a very hedonistic lifestyle, and one day he wanted to turn that all around. He ended up becoming a Christian, and later on created Bible Man as a way to help bring kids closer to God. But he would do it in a way that would entertain them rather than bore them to tears. Around the time of the show's conception, there was barely any Christian children's media out there, and much less good ones, so he decided to make Bible Man. Two mixed results. The series was owned by Pamplin Entertainment for the most part, while Willie Ames was the main guy behind the project, Pamplin Entertainment fully held the rights. The show started off as a little bit of a sitcom sort of thing, kind of going back to his roots on Eight is Enough and Charles in Charge. But it would morph to being somewhat of a more straightforward superhero show, but also still having that goofy sitcom -y edge. But we'll discuss that more as we get further down the line. The show was kind of a hit, kind of not, hard to explain. So, amongst most Christian audiences, it was really well received. It would often be the number two Christian children's show right next to VeggieTales. However, in popular culture, this thing was ripped to shreds, both for the way it taught its lessons and its rather lackluster production values. Eventually, Williams would leave the show in order to focus on his family and spend more time with them. Shortly after, the rights to the show were bought by Tommy Nelson. Under their control, Tommy Nelson changed the show into Bible Man Power Source. More on that later on, of course. Bible Man is about a character named Miles Peterson, a man who had it all. Wealth, status, success. Still, something was lacking, yada yada, I don't want to just quote the intro here. Basically, he gives up on all these worldly possessions and then decides to commit himself to God. And then suddenly becomes Bible Man. It's very inconsistent whether Bible Man is a secret identity of his or if he's just Bible Man and everyone knows it. So enough with explanations, let's get into the very first episode of Bible Man, The Six Lies of the... No, that's not the first episode. So if we're going by the Tommy Nelson releases, The Six Lies of the Fiddler would be the very first. However, Tommy Nelson didn't re-release every episode of Bible Man when they bought the rights. They skipped out on two, excluding the live shows, of course. Big Big Book and Back to School. Big Big Book is honestly one of the worst episodes of Bible Man of them all with the worst production values and basically not even a plot at all. It's about Bible Man trying to entertain some kids with a story of his past, and then the second half of it is just a concert. That's pretty much it. Back to School's a little bit of an improvement, but it's still ridiculously goofy and has really bad production values, though, I will say, the budget was basically that of a ham sandwich, so they can't really be fully blamed here. But the weird thing about these episodes is that Bible Man isn't really the main character. In fact, in Big Big Book especially, he barely shows up. It's more about the kids that take part in this church youth group than it is about Bible Man, you know, the title character. But still, if Willie Ames was trying to make these entertaining and unique children's programs, then he wasn't really doing a very good job. Mostly with Big Big Book. Again, back to school was where they were trying to find their footing. 
Big Big Book, on the other hand, you can pretty much find the equivalent to this episode on a worship CD. You don't really have to buy the VHS. And now we get to the six lies of the Fibbler. Once again, Bible Man is not the main character, although he shows up a lot more here, and his character is a lot more fully realized. In the last two, they couldn't really decide whether they wanted him to be a stoic superhero or a bumbling goof as his Miles Peterson alter ego. Maybe I should draw attention to that. I know I just said that we don't really know if he has an alter ego or not, but that was part of the Bible Man show, not the Bible Man adventure. Confused? Bible Man went through four different variations during its entire run. The Bible Man show, which was kind of campy, cheesy, and mostly focused on the kid characters. The Bible Man adventure, which is what most people think of when they hear the word Bible Man. Bible Man power source, which is Tommy Nelson's take on the series. And then the animated adventure. <sighs> okay, that's not gonna be fun, but that's for the end of this video. Oh boy. The Six Lies of the Fibbler covers one of the most commonly taught lessons in any children's media, whether it be Christian or secular. Don't tell lies. And it doesn't really do a very good job in this episode because the Fibbler, the main villain of this episode, he controls one of the kids and forces her to lie. At one point she started talking about how when she began lying she couldn't stop, but yeah, that's true because she was being forced to by this creepy villain. The villain in this episode is a straight up demon. That's something that we don't really get a lot of in Bible Man, is explanations for who these villains are. Are they humans that work for the devil? Are they demons? Who knows, but this time he's an outright demon. One that makes the lesson very difficult to get across, like I said. Also, funny thing, this episode is called The Six Lies of the Fibbler, but I only counted five lies. I don't know where the sixth one is, can someone help me out here? Please, Bible Man fans out there, please help! The Bible Man suit looks a lot better than it did in the first two episodes, but the fighting hasn't gotten better at all. It's really jerky, it's really stiff, and yeah, I know that's the Fibbler's quote-unquote fighting style, but Bible Man has this too. I'm sorry, but the choreography is just not very good here. It gets a little bit better as the series goes on, but the weird fight scenes is kind of a staple of the series. You just kind of have to sit back and laugh a little bit. Overall, the episode is... rough. You can tell what they were trying to do, it just didn't really work in execution. Part of the problem is that, much like the next episode, Silencing the Gossip Queen, Bible Man is not the main character. Instead, it's these boring youth group kids. They're not bad, but they're just bland. Luckily, Bible Man has even more of a presence in Silencing the Gossip Queen than he did in Six Lies of the Fibbler. This time, it's actually about Bible Man, and the kids are the side characters like how it should be. Does that mean the episode's good? No. No, it's not. I will say, though, it does a good job with teaching its lesson, at least for Bible Man standards. It shows how gossip and idle rumors can destroy a friendship, even one that's really strong. And this time, they're not being forced to commit the sin, they just do it on their own accord. Of course, how it happens is kind of goofy and a bit rushed, but at least they go a little bit more in-depth here and have some better fight scenes than in the last episode, though the Gossip Queen's death sequence is kind of ridiculous. They also have a really bad, really cheesy, but also really fun and catchy villain song here, so... Yeah, I mean, it's not good, but it's fun, and it's the best Bible Man episode so far. You can tell that they were a lot happier with this episode than the last one because they took it as an invitation to start getting bigger. They were ready to get ambitious and to take this new show to new heights. And that meant talking about some serious topics, like doubting Christianity. Oh boy. For those of you who don't know, this is the episode that got Bible Man into the eyes of the secular crowd. And as I said earlier, that wasn't really a good thing. It was made fun of relentlessly, partially because of how they did the lesson. Now, as a Christian, this is one of the most important lessons you can teach. But at the same time, Bible Man is gonna do this? Really? He's gonna talk about what you should do when you're having trouble with your faith? Oh no. It's kind of like when Captain Planet tried to teach kids about AIDS. It's just wrong. 
Now, I'll say that they do an okay job with the lesson, sort of. It works on the surface level, but then when you start thinking about it, it doesn't really answer any of your questions. This is honestly something they can't really fix because of two reasons. One, this is way too short. If they wanted to get into this lesson, and I mean really get into it, this needed to be a longer episode, not like 28 minutes. And second, the lesson isn't the only thing they're focusing on here. This isn't a sermon, this isn't some kind of radio broadcast telling you about different lessons you could be learning each week. It's an action-adventure comedy show. For as much time as they spend on the lesson, they spend double the amount of time with our villain The Shadow of Doubt, or Bible Man and his computer friend Eunice and his new sidekick Coates. There's a song sequence, they do a lot of really crazy fights. They're trying to do too much in too little time for this deep of subject matter. And despite the lesson being a really serious and important one, they go really far with the goofiness here. Not in a good way either. They just shoehorn in as many jokes as they possibly can, but they go for quantity over quality. It's like they have the impression that random and wacky automatically equals funny. They don't really have any reactions or substantial elements to the joke, it's just, wow, Ludacris is saying something, well, ludicrous. Bible Man and Coates have a conversation that brings up a pop culture reference. And of course, Bible reference. Please laugh. It's clear that Willie Ames is trying to call back to his sitcom days by making this show basically a superhero sitcom, but there's a time and a place for this, and this was most certainly not it. I mean, if it was funny, I'd give him a break, but no, it's not. This is honestly one of my least favorite episodes of Bible Man. It's just a cluttered mess. Even when I was a kid, I didn't really like it. The only good thing I can say about it, aside from the So Bad It's Good song, Ooh, he's looking fine. is the main villain, the Shadow of Doubt. This guy is played by Brian Lemons, and he is a legend. He would come back again and again and again over the course of the Bible Man adventure, and I can definitely see why. He's a really good actor, he's fun, he's energetic, and he can be threatening when he needs to be. Sadly, he wasn't really directed very well in this episode, and I do know that it's the direction. In most of the other episodes, he does a really good job, and he's definitely my favorite character. Possibly in response to the Shadow of Doubt fiasco, although that's not confirmed, it's just a personal theory of mine, they decided to go back to simpler lessons in their next episode, The Incredible Force of Joy. And looking at your screen, you can tell right away that things are pretty different. Bible Man has a new costume. The production values have gotten a little bit better. The shots are framed to be less like a sitcom and more like an action-adventure show, like what it's supposed to be. I gotta say, at least in terms of a production, this was a major step up. And for what it's worth, the lessons taught decently well here. This episode's all about something that everyone can understand, having your heart and your thoughts in a positive place. Sometimes bad things happen to you, and sometimes it feels like they'll never get better. But when that happens, you need to focus on what you do have and what is going right, and you'll at least be a little bit better off. And of course, it talks about relying on God, of course, it wouldn't be Bible Man if it didn't do that. So, was this episode good? I'd say it's decent, actually. There are just two things that hold it back. Firstly, our designated Kid of the Week is honestly not a very good actor at all. He's pretty stiff, he's pretty wooden, and he just sounds like he's reading off a script most of the time, probably because he is. And secondly, that humor, man, they just will not stop. They throw in a random never-ending story reference for crying out loud. I mean, come on, really? Falcor! Atreyu! And it's all paced so poorly. The jokes don't happen naturally. It just feels like Willie Ames was going, okay, joke here. Secret agent Eunice is on the case. She has been watching way too much TV. Joke here. The producers gave this part to me because Carmen wasn't available. <laughs> joke here, we need to keep adding jokes. They're not gonna pay attention if we don't have jokes. But other than that, the incredible force of joy is actually pretty decent. Now, I wouldn't go out of my way to watch it, but definitely for Bible Man, this is a major improvement. And I hope they carry that over into the next episode, The Fiendish Works of Dr. Fear. Spoiler alert, they almost did. They were so, so close to making this one good. They have the lesson that's taught really well. They have some actually pretty well choreographed action scenes for the most part. 
I mean, of course it still looks like they're trying to aim for each other's swords rather than their bodies, but I'd say they work well enough. And it's also the darkest that Bible Man's been so far. Bible Man fears losing his sidekick Coates. Whether that be him leaving the squad or him dying in action, it's kinda left open to interpretation. Either way, it takes a little bit of a serious look at some of Miles Peterson's personal flaws. That and his relationship with his best friend. Can he keep going on knowing that any single battle with Coates could be his last? Of course they all have to ruin it with all those jokes. This is the worst pacing that Bible Man has ever had. The jokes are extremely painful here. Because on one hand you have a decently told story and a good lesson, but then you just gotta throw in this really weird, goofy bunch of demons that help Dr. Fear with his inventions. You have more random pop culture references and shoehorn wackiness. And once again, there's no transition, it's a breakneck pace. I know that seems like a minor element, but trust me, it's really important. Because every time you're about to be interested in what the characters are going through, or the story that's going on, or you're trying to learn about the lesson, they just do something stupid and goofy, and then they don't stop. But I will say that this is some of Brian Lemon's finest work. He really nails Dr. Fear. I mean, technically, yeah, they're all Luxor Spondroth in-universe, they're the same guy, but still. Maybe it's what they did to his voice in post-production, maybe it's the way he carries himself, I don't know. But I think that Dr. Fear is one of his best roles, and this could have been one of the best Bible Man episodes of them all. It's just such a shame that they had to go back to the Big Big Book Six Lies of the Fibbler stuff and just goof it all up. This next one, Conquering the Wrath of Rage, is honestly pretty interesting, but not for the reasons you might think. The episode itself is... okay. The action's okay, the lesson is okay, the humor is still painful, and that song is... wow. I mean, some of the songs in Bible Man can be so bad they're good, or Nothing Makes Me Happy's case they're just good good, but this is just bad really bad. It's a needless parody, it's shoehorned in, it's awkward as can be, it just doesn't work. No, this episode was made in response to critics. Not secular critics, Christian critics, or as I call them, Karens. Yeah, basically a bunch of soccer moms were getting all up in arms about how Bible Man deals with most of his problems with violence, even though he doesn't. He never attacks the kids, and he only really fights the villains in self-defense. And for that matter, they're demons. But anyways, the crew behind Bible Man decided to make this episode to show that, see? Bible Man doesn't resort to violence to get his way. I mean, he sort of does, you know, considering how he kills a lot of his enemies, especially in the next episode with a very gruesome death. But he doesn't in this one, instead he literally just stands there and lets God do all the work, because... Bible? And then it causes the villain to melt into slime. Yeah, that's not violent. This episode's also worth talking about because of Coates. You know, the subject of the last episode where Bible Man was so afraid of losing him? Yeah, well, turns out he lost Coates. We don't really know how, all he really says is, and I quote, Coates had to leave and I understood that. But we never get an explanation as to where he goes or why he left. But instead, Bible Man gets a brand new sidekick, Cypher. Cypher would stay throughout the rest of the Bible Man live action series. He would later be replaced in the animated version, of course, but to be fair, nobody really returned for that, so I can't really blame him. Cypher as a character is kind of bland, he doesn't really have a lot of personality to him, but the actor's pretty charming and is clearly having a lot of fun. Next up is Shattering the Prince of Pride. This is the very first episode of Bible Man that I ever saw, so in a weird way, it'll always hold a special place in my heart. Maybe I'm a little nostalgia blind or biased on this one, but I think this is one of the better episodes of Bible Man. All the same general points of Conquering the Wrath of Rage can be carried over here, except the humor is surprisingly not that bad here. There are a couple times that actually made me laugh, especially this one scene where Brian Lemmons just totally breaks character and just loses his mind. <laughs> we really got him that time, didn't we? <laughs> we'll show him this time. It's our fifth time doing this whole thing. We never get it right. <laughs> he always beats us up every single time. We keep spending the money, making these costumes, making ourselves up with the makeup, and we never win. <laughs> That's the most hysterical thing about 
locked his home. Go. We never win, Ludacris. We never win. <laughs> there was also a pretty unexpected Tommy Boy reference. I'll admit, that got a pretty big kick out of me. And then in the middle of the fight scene, Bible Man and the Prince of Pride play rock, paper, scissors, and go fish. These moments are silly, they're goofy, but they're just fun. And more importantly, they actually fit in the overall tone. They don't just come out of nowhere and feel forced. No, that's for the rest of the jokes to take care of. There's the scene where Bible Man and the Prince of Pride imitate Japanese kung fu movies. There's Bible Man rambling on about how pride and destruction is like Donnie and Marie or whatever. These moments don't fit. These moments aren't funny. These moments are exactly like all the ones I've been talking about before. However, it's shown here that they can actually manage to make something funny. All they really need to do is learn some comedic pacing, and not rely on endless pop culture references or random wackiness. Before we move on to the next episode though, I do want to point out that this has the most gruesome scene in any Bible Man episode ever. This is how the Prince of Pride dies. children's show. Christian children's show. And they actually let that slide. When Tommy Nelson re-released this episode, they didn't cut that out. And I only mention that because Tommy Nelson did a little bit of a hatchet job when these episodes were released on DVD. For the most part, these episodes were untouched. When the adventures of the Bible Man Adventure were re-released on DVD, there were only some small differences like a few new graphics here and there and the series overall being renamed to Bible Man Genesis. There were three notable exceptions though. The Prince of Pride is one of them. That and Defeating the Shadow of Doubt had their songs completely replaced. Yeah, the iconic Prince of Pride and Shadow of Doubt villain songs were changed entirely. And in both cases, they were a major downgrade. The Shadow of Doubt song in particular is just, well, take a listen. I am a villain with molded teeth. Some say I'm stinky, I say I'm sweet. The other one, this one really confuses me, is the Six Lies of the Fibbler. No, they didn't add the missing sixth lie in post-production. What they did was alter the Fibbler's voice to give him some kind of weird warped effect. Yeah, I was really confused because I grew up with the DVDs. So when my church gave away their VHS copy of The Six Lies of the Fibbler, I picked it up because, hey, free collectible. But then, needless to say, when I gave it a watch, I was very confused. So yes, Tommy Nelson decided to rework the Fibbler's voice in The Six Lies of the Fibbler, but not remove this death from the Prince of Pride. Which, by the way, comes right after the episode where they talk about how Bible Man doesn't deal with all of his conflicts with violence. Yeah, I can really tell with this episode, guys. Great job. Now we go on to Breaking the Bonds of Disobedience, which, in my personal opinion, one of the most interesting episodes in all of Bible Man. However, that doesn't exactly mean that it's good, because it's, well, not. At all. For one thing, it's got a lot more of a darker tone and atmosphere. The whole point is about Bible Man getting kidnapped and injected with some kind of toxin that makes him feel... Diso... Obedient, I guess? I don't know, it's not executed in the best way, but at least on paper it sounds pretty dark. It's also literally dark, as in there's a lot of dark colors and shadows everywhere, and I gotta say, at least visually speaking, it's one of the most interesting episodes in the series. And also the lesson of disobedience sounds good, they just don't quite do it right. At least with Bible Man, they kinda do it better with Bible Girl. Uh, Oh, yeah, I guess I should probably bring her up, right? Yes, as of now, there's a Bible girl added to the team, and what does she add? Well, to be honest, not much. She kind of has the same personality as Bible Man, except one, she's a girl, and two, she's more inexperienced. Other than that, she's basically the same character. They're mostly level-headed, they're devout Christians, and they also like being fun and expressive. That's pretty much it. And Bible Man's already not the strongest character out there, so having two of them... Not great, but also not bad. It's just that, well, Eunice was a far better female character already. For one, she actually had a personality, and two, she's actually fun and funny. 
Anyways, the reason I say that the lessons executed well with Bible Girl is because it actually makes a lot more sense. She can either go on to be a big Broadway star, or she can join the Bible Man team. One of them's what she wants, and the other's what God wants. Is she gonna do what God tells her to do, or is she gonna chase after her own interests? That's well done. I gotta give him credit for that. So that, combined with a darker atmosphere and tone, would make this thing one of the better episodes if they didn't also have things like Ludacris butting in every couple seconds with even worse jokes than normal, and also this weird Forrest Gump bit that makes no sense. Mama always used to say, your life would be like a box of molded chocolates. Thanks, man. Look at this here chocolate. Would you eat this? Also, here's a weird little thing that annoyed me ever since I was little. The villain in this episode, Luxor Spondroth, is the same villain that's been here since Shadow of Doubt. Yeah, it's still been the same guy all throughout. And they go for a little bit of continuity going over all his past villain guises, except for one. Let's see if you can pick out the one missing. Dr. Fear? Nope. Master of Misery? Uh-uh. Prince of Pride? Try again. Furioso? I'm Luxor Spondra. Yeah, Shadow of Doubt is nowhere to be found. This is either because one, they just forgot to put it in, or two, they didn't really want to harken back to the classic suit era, or as one of my friends calls it, the McDonald's suit era. Or even more likely, actually, now that I think of it, this isn't even in the script, maybe they didn't call back to Shadow of Doubt because that got them in a lot of trouble. Remember how that got them a bunch of widespread scrutiny and people were saying that the lesson didn't make sense and it just generally made the show look bad? Who knows? That could be why they forgot Shadow of Doubt here, but either way, I guess it's kind of nice that we have some continuity here. So as a whole, Breaking the Bonds of Disobedience is kind of all over the place, really. It's not good, it's not bad, it's just all right. I'd say it's on the better end of Bible Man, but it's still not really something I'd give a passing grade. It's fine, don't get me wrong, and I really like that they're trying some new stuff. I just wish that these concepts and themes were better executed, you know? Oh look, here that is right now, be careful what you wish for, right? Lead Us Not Into Temptation is easily the best episode of Bible Man so far. Though spoiler alert, it's not gonna hold the title of best that much longer. Still though, this was a much simpler take on the darker storyline, and it worked pretty well. It takes a look at the temptation of newly formed Christians going back to their old ways of life. After all, when you become a Christian, you're not supposed to embrace the old sin you used to have. You're trying to grow and become different. There's the social pressure, and all the good memories you used to have in your old life. But of course, you have to stay strong and be the new you. That's what this whole episode's about. It's not being tempted to like, oh, I don't know, take seconds on dessert or something. It's something meaningful, something impactful. And Bible Man isn't really the central focus. It's Cypher, the one with the most personality. Here we get into his backstory and realize that he too is a new Christian. So he's trying to stay afloat, but uh-oh, the villain convinces him to hang out with his old buddy, and that buddy is no good. And then there's that ending. Luxor, Ludacris, and Lucy all die a pretty gruesome death. Not as gruesome as, say, the Prince of Pride, but wow, poor Lucy. Of course, Lucy's coming back, but Luxor and Ludacris? Never. They never show up in the series again. Unless you count the animated version, but those are two different characters entirely. These guys? They're gone. Now, I'm not sure why this happened. Maybe they just decided to get rid of the characters because they wanted to try somebody new. Maybe Brian Lemons wanted out of the show? I don't know. But whatever the reason, this was a pretty good episode to send the characters off with. It's dark, but not too dark. It's fun, although not necessarily funny. Has a good lesson, and one grand finale fight scene at the very end. How could they possibly top this? Well, the two-parter episode that comes up next, Jesus Our Savior. This is good. And I'm not saying good for Bible Man, I'm just saying this is good, period. Everything that Breaking the Bonds of Disobedience tried, this succeeds at. And everything that Lead Us Not Into Temptation did and succeeded at, this does it again. In this episode, we get the introduction of Primordius Drool, Intergalactic Desperado of Destruction and Despot of Evil. Or just drool as they call him because it's only a 40 minute show. Yeah, he's goofy. Yeah, he's an obvious parody of Jerry Lewis slash Buddy Love from The Nutty Professor. But I can't help it. I like this guy. He's funny when he needs to be because yes, he can actually be funny every so often. 
but he's also something that very few Bible Man villains have been before. I can legitimately see this guy as a threat. Don't get me wrong, Brian Lemons was able to do this too, but for Primordius? For the very first time, it feels like Bible Man and his friends might not win. This has the best production values in the entire show, and it also has the biggest scale. Especially that fight scene at the end. Don't get me wrong, this thing isn't great, and it definitely has its fair share of issues, but I gotta say, I was pleasantly surprised. Going back, I didn't think this would hold up as well as it did. Now am I gonna go out of my way to watch it? Eh, I don't think so, but all the things that they had to do, they really pulled it off. The lesson's good, the fighting's good, and the characterization is surprisingly strong. For the very first time, I feel like Miles Peterson is a real character. He has all these worries about getting old and wanting to retire, and we get to see that fully on display. Not to mention all the pressure he's feeling with being treated like the one guy who can save the whole city when in fact that's supposed to be God. He's inadvertently taking all the credit. If you're curious about Bible Man and just want one episode to seek out and watch, this is the one. This is the one I'd recommend above all others, no contest. Yeah, Incredible Force of Joy and Lead Us Not Into Temptation were pretty good for what they were, but this was just good, so I gotta give him a hand for that. Light in the Darkness is up next. Believe it or not, A Light in the Darkness is actually a sequel to Jesus Our Savior. See, look, they even have Primordius Drool. Yeah, I know that doesn't look like him, but trust me, it is. So, apparently, in-universe, what happened was that Primordius got reprimanded and demoted for failing in Jesus our Savior. So, instead of being Buddy Love, he became Sherman Kelp. And if you thought that the Jerry Lewis thing was kind of amusing in Jesus our Savior, it really overstays its welcome here. I will say, Jeff Scott does a decent Sherman Kelp impression, but that does not make the episode good, nor does it make him a good villain. He feels more like the villain's sidekick than the actual bad guy. And of course, unlike Primordius, I can't take him seriously. All that grandeur and scale and pizzazz, all gone. Instead, we just have this dork doofus that just bumbles around all the time and can't get anything right. The lesson kind of feels like a retread of the incredible force of joy, though for what it's worth, it does do the lesson pretty well. And I also have to applaud this episode for doing something that I don't think any other Bible Man episode's done before or since. The random kid of the week with the problem isn't some little kid or middle schooler. I mean, it doesn't really change all that much in the grand scheme of things, it's just a nice little gesture. But this has easily the worst villain song in the entire franchise. Take a listen. I've been doing some experiments in my lab. Mixing several compound elements that I have. And my conclusion is unanimous, true, and sound. I've created a cloud of darkness that covers this town. Yeah, alright, that was something. A Light in the Darkness is fine, I guess. It doesn't really do anything that right aside from the Kid of the Week, but it also doesn't really do something that wrong aside from having the wacky protester being our villain. But, since he's not going away, I can't say that that's a Light in the Darkness problem exclusively. It also carries over into the next two episodes, which, speaking of which, Divided We Fall, also known as the last episode to have Miles Peterson slash Willie Ames. The original Bible Man and series creators gonna go after this episode, and how do they send him off? With little to no fanfare, although, I mentioned earlier that Willie Ames wanted to leave Bible Man to spend more time with his family, and honestly, that's a pretty admirable decision. And I think that's why they have that retirement subplot in Jesus Our Savior. But then, after the very beginning of A Light in the Darkness, it just gets dropped. And it's not mentioned in Divided We Fall at all. So... he just disappears, I guess? Poor Willie Ames. He created this show and then got no send-off whatsoever. I mean, yeah, they technically have a little bit of a thing in the next episode of Fight for Faith, but that doesn't really count. This episode's all about unity, and it's kinda... Eh. They do an okay job with the lesson, it's just that the story's really repetitive. First off, it has a lot more of the wacky protester than in the last episode, and that's not a good thing because he's really, really not funny. He may be kind of quirky and charming at first, but he gets old really quickly. But the story basically amounts to this. The wacky protester wants to split up the Bible Man team, so one person from the team stays home while he plays with them a fake video of the other two members trash-talking the one staying at home. And then that happens three times, and they fight, then they stop fighting, and then they fight the wacky protester. That's basically the entire story, and I didn't really cut anything out. 
yeah, he has that evil plan of broadcasting some kind of fake children's show to the entire world, but does that really matter? They barely ever talk about it, and it doesn't actually happen, so yeah. I don't know why, but I really liked this one as a kid, but now as an adult, I think this one's aged the worst. I'm not saying it's the worst episode of them all, definitely not, but I'm saying that in terms of my perception as a kid compared to my perception as an adult, this one had the biggest decline. It's standard by the books Bible Man, so basically everything that I've said about the episodes before can be applied here. There's nothing really special, there's nothing really unique, so let's move on to a fight for faith. The last pre-Power Source episode there is. And it's an okay one to go out on. So for this one, everything I said about breaking the bonds of disobedience, except for the Bible Girl bit and the dark colors, that can be applied here. The scope is bigger, it's a little bit darker in tone, but it just doesn't really work in execution. Partially because while they're trying to have this bigger story about these kids being lured to a world with no god, Almost half the episode is the wacky protester being a goof and going through an identity crisis and changing his name to Rutong Gi. Once again, he's not funny and he gets old really quickly, and now that I've seen three episodes with him now, I'm longing for the days of Dr. Fear or Primordius Drool. How does the new Bible Man fare? Yeah, you can't replace Willie Ames, but he does a decent job for what he's given. Again, this episode isn't very good, so it's not the greatest introduction. Still though, the actor does a pretty good job. The character, on the other hand, Josh Carpenter, can best be described as... There's nothing to this guy except... He's nice. And that's it. Miles Peterson wasn't exactly a complex or deep character either, but still, this is pretty bad. Good actor, just not a good character to go with him. Even so, this is the best way to finish off the first run of Bible Man. It has all the strengths and weaknesses that the show had fully on display. And it's good that it showed that to the audience right now, because after this episode, things would change forever. With Tommy Nelson purchasing the series, they decided to retool it into Bible Man Power Source. And it was basically a completely different show, but also at the same time, a flanderization of the original. It would still be a goofy, campy, Christian-based children's show, but everything felt noticeably off, I guess you could say. First of all, they're no longer in the Bible cave, they're literally stuck in a trailer. Yeah, all that high-tech equipment, all that computerized stuff that Eunice had from before, now it's here, in a trailer park. Alright, I mean, I guess that's quirky and fun. Bible Man's still here, well, the new one at least. Cypher's still here, Eunice is still here, but Bible Girl is gone. Well, gone for a little bit, but then she comes back two episodes later. In the meantime, she's replaced with this girl named Melanie, who's Bible Man's cousin, and she's basically the exact same character, so moving on. Bible Man was a goofy show, yes, but it still had some grounding in reality. It still had some moments where it could sit back and be quiet and take things easy. In Power Source, it's like they wanted to be a live-action cartoon. Everything is always energized, everything's always buzzing, and snappy, and woo. I'll admit, if you're a cynic and you just want to laugh at something, these are the episodes to do it with. However, if you're looking for an actually competent show, or one that had some heart behind it, I think I'd rather stick with classic Bible Man, or as Tommy Nelson calls it, Bible Man Genesis. Sure, it may not have been a great show, but for one, its heart was in the right place. And two, even if things didn't work in execution, you can still tell that they were trying to do their own thing. They were trying to be Bible Man, simple as that. Bible Man Power Source constantly has this corporate feeling to it. It doesn't feel like it's coming from a real, genuine place of wanting to teach and tell a story. All the wackiness, all the really easy lessons they go for, it just feels like a bunch of people in suits made this, and it doesn't feel right. Next to VeggieTales, Bible Man was the biggest earner at the time, so they had to keep running with it, and just like VeggieTales, they let the corporate side take over. However, unlike VeggieTales, there wasn't some kind of big movie that they released way too early in their life and it caused the whole thing to go belly up, but let's talk about that probably never. So many people have already talked about that, so let's move back to Bible Man, the first episode of Bible Man Power Source, terminating the toxic tonic of disrespect. Okay, there's something else I gotta mention. All of the titles for the episodes, except for one, will be blanking the blank of blank. And sometimes they'll really stretch to find a verb, like lambasting the legions of laziness. Really? That was the best title you had? They think they're charming, rakish, roguish, 
Anyways, turning back to... Ter- the, uh, oh, come on, this is so hard to say. Turning back to terminating the toxic tonic of disrespect. Why did I write it like that? That's impossible to say. Anyways, I'd say that this is the best episode of Bible Man Power Source. It's not bad, it's actually kind of decent. There's some darker elements to this. The villain's a little bit creepier, which I kind of like. And another nice little touch is that the kid of the week is older this time, kind of like a light in the darkness. Like I said last time, it's not some kind of big game changer, but it's nice. Also, the lesson's a little bit of an interesting one to talk about. Yeah, sure, respect is something that's kind of an easy lesson to go for, but I like the way they do it. It's not respecting your parents or your teachers or anything like that. It's respecting your peers. What happens here is that Kid of the Week drinks some kind of energy drink created by our villain, Dr. Snortenskoff, and he starts trash-talking his teammates on his baseball team, especially this one player in particular that's less than talented, let's just say. Meanwhile, Bibleman and Cypher have to learn to respect the new girl because they're not used to working with her. Again, this episode isn't great, but in terms of Bibleman, yeah, this really does the job well. This is probably on my top five favorite episodes, which I guess I have a list of that now? Maybe? After this came tuning out the unholy hero. Right off the bat, I gotta say that the best part of the episode isn't even in the episode at all. It's a song that got cut made by Mark Smemby. If you want to look it up, go check out his channel. It's the video super famous. I gotta say, the song is really good. And I'm not talking about good for Bible Man standards. I mean good, period. It's an earworm. It's fun. It's upbeat. It fits the style and the tone. What more do you want? Well, I guess having it be in the episode would have been nice. This episode is another one that takes an interesting look at a commonly done lesson. Bad influences. It goes through that whole tired old argument of, oh, you better be careful of what you watch on TV because they're going to lead you down a bad path. Only in this case, it makes them talk black to their parents. No, I didn't mean talk back to them. I really did mean talk black. Turn the TV off, please, and call your sister to dinner. I'm busy right now. Yeah, uh, okay. What? I said it was interesting. I didn't really say it was good. This episode overall is... Alright, essentially it does everything that Toxic Tonic did well, and does it less good, but still fine. It's definitely on the upper end of Bible Man, but still not something I'd necessarily recommend. However, there are two factors to this episode that I really have to give them credit for, and no, the song isn't one of them. First of all, the villain's a whole lot of fun. He's clearly having the time of his life, he's a good actor, and he's got a lot of charisma. What's not to like? And second, this is the last episode of Bible Man where Bible Man kills his foe. Yeah, maybe I didn't mention that. Those instances in Conquering the Wrath of Rage and Shattering the Prince of Pride, yeah, that wasn't an isolated thing. Those happen in almost every episode. The only one that it doesn't happen in is a fight for faith. So I guess the wacky protester's still alive but living in his own god-free world or whatever happened? Something like that, I guess. This is the only episode in Bible Man Power Source where Bible Man kills his foe. And that's not normally such a big deal, except these are demons. They're not people. Bible Man's not murdering somebody or even killing a person in self-defense. They are actually Hellspawn. I don't see the issue. Is it that it's violent and encourages bad things to happen? Well, if that's the case, you should get rid of all the fight scenes. That's really violent too, don't you think? From here on out, Bible Man will either shrink his foes, put them in jars, or in one case, literally mail them to hell. Yeah, he can't kill them, no more stabbing them, or blowing them up, or having them be electrocuted in a very gruesome manner. Nope, just shove them in a box and send them down to the fiery pits of hell. Because that's what a Christian would do, I guess. On the whole, tuning out the unholy hero is passable, it's fine. It's enjoyable mostly because of the villain too cool for school, but when you get to the Bible Man Gang stuff, or, oh no no, I'm sorry, they're now called the Bible Adventure Team, yeah, that's a cool name, then it kind of sags. And that is definitely true for the next episode, Crushing the Conspiracy of the Cheater. One thing I got to address right off the bat is that this has a product placement for Pump It Up. If you don't know what Pump It Up is, it was this old party place where they had inflatable slides and games and basically just anything a kid would like. But it's not fully a product placement because they changed the name to Jump It Up so that they don't get sued. So why did you include that here? 
It also adds nothing to the story and just exists to kind of have a goofy, dumb fight scene. I even thought this was weird when I was a kid. The lesson of cheating is basic and they teach it in a very basic way. The Bible Adventure Team, that just doesn't sound right. Their stuff is just eh. It doesn't amount to anything, it's not fun, it's not interesting, it's really hokey and corny. Speaking of hokey and corny, we got the villain, the cheater. He is everything I just said about the Bible Adventure Team except for the boring stuff. This guy is a hoot. The actor is hamming it up like mad. If you thought that Too Cool for School was having the time of his life, you ain't seen nothing yet. But everyone does it sometime! Haven't you ever peaked during hide and seek? <laughs> what can I say? I'm a giver! All you've ever given is trouble. <laughs> he was in terminating the toxic tonic of disrespect as a cameo, but here he is, fully on display. I guess they really liked writing for the character or something because they brought him back here as the main villain. And he works really well. He's really the only thing I like about this episode. This is where that corporate feeling really starts to take over. It's unavoidable here, and aside from the cheater, it's flat, dull, boring, and basic. And you know what? I can basically copy and paste the same review for the next episode, Lambasting the Legions of Laziness, except the villain's not nearly as fun. He's basically just this Santa guy who wants people to be lazy and he keeps forgetting his name. Also, yes, this is the episode with the CinemaSins guy in it. Just thought I'd bring that up. This episode's already been reviewed by Say Goodnight Kevin, and really, he got it right. There's nothing else I can add, so moving on. Blasting the Game Master Bully. Wow, just wow. This is just so kidified and flat, and really, what else can I say? I think out of every episode of Bible Man, aside from the animated stuff, this is the worst. This is the absolute worst. Even as a kid I agreed, there's nothing to this at all. A basic bullying lesson, Bible Man suddenly has a secret identity he wants to keep, and yes, Bible Man lets himself get picked on by a robot enemy of his, because I guess that makes sense? That's our big strong hero everybody, getting picked on by an evil robot bully. I got this episode when I was a kid, I watched it once, and never again. I was thoroughly unimpressed, and going back to it as an adult, it's even worse. With this episode, it becomes abundantly clear that Bible Man's just running on fumes. So what better way to show that you're running on fumes than by making one final episode? At least I think that's what it was supposed to be. In the Presence of Enemies really feels like they were trying to make a big grand finale, but it just didn't work. For one thing, In the Presence of Enemies doesn't really have a lesson. They try to say it's about reading your Bible and making sure you know it, but they barely touch on that at all. And the plot makes no sense. Basically, all the villains team up together, which for one thing, how, Too Cool for School is supposed to be dead, and Slacker is supposed to be burning in the pits of hell. And I know that sounds bad out of context, but that's what happened in the episode, remember? Also, Dr. Snortenskopf just appears via cameo in this, so he's still at large. Go get him, Bible man! Oh wait, you can't. The series is over. But yeah, the whole thing is basically an excuse to have a bunch of callbacks to the Bible Man power source villains, and it doesn't really work. I like some of the banter they have, but it gets old really quickly because largely, it's all the same thing. I Am Wonderful is full of herself and sassy, Slacker's always slacking off, Cheater is- okay, Cheater's still awesome. But you get the point. This was another one where I got it as a kid, and I just couldn't stand to watch it one more time. In fact, after I watched it, I thought, alright, no more. I'm done. The show has clearly gotten derailed, it's not fun anymore, I'm done, I'm giving up. And wouldn't you know it, that was the last episode, so I guess I jumped off right at the right time. Except, no. Bible Man ended with little to no fanfare aside from this episode, which was quietly released and then quickly forgotten about. The series lived on through discussions of, hey, remember Bible Man? And of course, internet reviews and memes. But then, tragedy struck. It came back. In animated form. Dear God. There's more. No. This. Oh, wow. I knew this would be a disaster right from the first trailer. 
And I was right. I think they're taking a page from VeggieTales in the house here by trying to make some kind of rushed, not well-written, slapped-together animated adventure. And if that's true, then they really did it right here. And by that, I mean it crashes and burns every single time. All the bad stuff about Bible Man Power Source is all this show is, but even bigger. For one thing, the animation doesn't even look finished, so if you want to make fun of all the effects from the live action series, that's fine. But take a look at this, and this. My eyes are on fire! Ah! Ah! They released this, people. They gave this to the general public and thought they would eat it up. None of the voice cast returns as far as I can tell, and they're doing an alright job. It's serviceable, and that's about it. The lessons are extremely basic, the writing isn't fun or funny. When watching all the episodes that I saw, I couldn't imagine any kid getting into this. Bible Man should have stayed over. It was past its prime and it was already falling apart during the Power Source era. Why did they think this was a good idea? There wasn't a fan base anymore, there wasn't really a set market. I can't believe I'm gonna say this, but the animated version is an insult to Bible Man and it should not stand for this at all. Bible Man deserves better. Even if it wasn't necessarily a good show, I still have a soft spot for it. It may be weird, it may be goofy, it may not really do things right in the grand scheme of things, but not only was it trying to do the right thing, but it was a passion project from a guy who was speaking from his heart. Whether or not you're a Christian, it can be said that religion can change your life for the better. Sometimes when you're down on your luck and you don't really know where your life's going and you're making mistake after mistake, turning to God can really fix things for you. Willie Ames felt that full well and wanted to share it with the world. It's just a shame that it didn't necessarily work out the way he intended. What with the bad press from defeating the shadow of doubt, to getting all those complaint letters about the violence in the show, to having to step away to spend more time with his family and leaving his creation behind, causing it to get turned into this and then later this? It's hard to get mad at him. In fact, I don't think I could. The worst that Bible Man got outside of blasting the Game Master bully in the presence of enemies and the animated stories, it was just eh. But even in the worst episodes, you could still find some fun. Whether it was laughing with or at the show, that's kind of subjective. And it's because of all those things I just said, I will always respect the original Bible Man. And I will always respect the first two episodes of Power Source. They wanted to take the series in a new direction, but still wanted to remain faithful to Willie Ames' original vision. But then they just lost the plot. I would say more, but honestly, I think I'd just be repeating myself, so... That's Bible Man. Whether it's good, bad, or totally weird, you can definitely say that it's unique. And hey, sometimes, uniqueness can be just the thing you need. Well, folks, thanks for watching the video. What'd you guys think? Have you seen Bible Man before? If so, what's your favorite episode? And also, what's your least? Comment below and let us know because we're always excited to hear what you guys have to say. Real quick, I'd like to thank our Patreon executive producers, Leaf Razor, Azarius, Whoopdo, Michaela Bellamy, MD the Dude, Blackjack, Nightingale Wednesday Nightmare, and Uncale. If you too would like your name read at the end of every Media Mementos video, then consider donating to our Patreon, which, by the way, has a link in the description below. Today's comment of the day goes to Tim Fortune 9. Skinner works best as a straight man to other characters. Example, he's the one who sets up Apu's brilliant Jurassic Park rant, but he truly shines when he's the comedic foil to Chalmers, Stephen Hams of the Peak, but there's so many others. My personal favorite is from Round Springfield, where Bart collapses from appendicitis in the nurse's office, and Skinner tries to distract Chalmers with the school snake, which is slithering by with a number of kids in it. Yeah, that's a great bit. Both of those bits, actually, the Jurassic Park one and the snake. I will say that the Skinner video proved that Skinner has a lot more fans than I thought, which I'm actually really happy about because, again, he's not my personal favorite, but I really like him. I think his popularity mostly grew from the steamed hams meme. I think that's where he kind of skyrocketed a little bit. Because before that, he was most certainly not character number one. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you guys next time!